Before we start, I always like to ask all the people who attend what, if they have ideas that they have worked on, because this is a pretty practical workshop. I'm going to go through a lot of websites, show you a lot of tools. And the basic idea of the workshop is if you have an idea for a business or a startup or a personal brand or anything that you want to start, how are you going to go from an idea in your head to turning into a reality of a live product that other people can use and go on and connect with? So how many of you have an idea for something very specific that you want to start but haven't started yet? Yeah, one person. Two, three, okay, good. And how many of you have an idea and have already kind of started working on it? Okay, and how many of you have an idea that you've been working on it for a while? Okay, and how about the rest of you? Don't we, how many of you don't have an idea? Where, who are the, what are the rest of the people? I mean, either you have an idea or kind of have an idea. Um, how many of you want to start something? I guess that's a better question. Okay, good. So the people who said they want to start something, if we can start from here and you can just give a little bit of information about what it is. And this, first of all, will help me to understand what you guys want to start with so I can tailor a lot of these parts to what I hear from you guys. And it will kind of open up to other people of what other people are working on and maybe get some ideas. So maybe start from here. So there are a few ideas. Uh, blockchain crowdfunding application, a platform for uh, people who are in the fashion zone that want to work with wearable technology, and a platform for lawyers. I think that's a pretty good spectrum of ideas. Uh, so basically, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit about myself and how I have come to learn a little bit about going from your idea to testing it and going prop through a proper process to launch it and develop your idea, which is the most important part of this whole process. And then I'm going to talk about the different stages of developing your idea so you can walk yourself through, your team th through, your investors through, or even if you want to bring people on your, into your company. It's really good to have a very good grasp of what your idea is in the first place. So. I, most, of the, uh, most of my time I spend in working with startup and brands on developing their online brand or their, their online business. So most of them are online technology businesses and a lot of them are online businesses that they want to be on YouTube or other places that, to generate money. But the problem is most people go through a lot of work. They hire five developers. They hire graphic designers, they create a lot of stuff, and then they launch, and then nothing happens, and then they're like, okay, I spent this much time and money of myself, my teammates, we launched, nothing has happened, what did go wrong? And that's a very costly experiment to run because you're hoping and you're tying all of your chances to one launch, and until then you have absolutely no way to know how valuable or how viable your idea is. So the basic idea of going through these steps of mock-ups to launch or minimum viable product is to try to get feedback on all of the assumptions you have about your product as soon as you can. And I apply the same idea for online marketing for the brands and companies that I work with. So if I have an idea about a brand or a way to position their content online, then I'm like, okay, this is going to work before going all out and hiring a videographer to shoot all these crazy looking videos and editing them or creating these infographs or setting up different pages or pitching their company in a certain way, first I try to create something very basic that takes minimal amount of effort on my side. At the same time, it lets me test a single assumption that I have. Does this content work? Do people like this type of product? Are there enough people that would understand what our product is? and they would pay for it. If they pay for it, how much would they pay for it? Because every time you're trying to market something or sell something or even gain traction for something, even if you're giving it out for free, you are dealing with a lot of assumptions about your product, about your market, about how the technology is going to come together and product, your product should work and probably something like a blockchain technology, you probably have a lot of you know, assumptions about, okay, which uh, kind of blo which blockchain you're going to use and then how does that make sure that it's safe and nobody can game the system and all these little stuff 
it's pretty difficult to leave all of these assumptions until you launch. Because then, if something goes wrong, and probably will, because you will be wrong about a lot of your assumptions, then you're out of luck. So these are some of the brands I've helped uh, grow the same way. Uh, one of them is Smart Start Me Up Videos. I actually work with Ryerson University. And we created just three videos to test if there are people who would be interested in this format of the content. And the format was someone interviewing, a student interviewing a professor about a very specific topic about business. So we had three videos, and we just, three videos, we grew it to like 1,000 subscribers and about 100, probably now more, 60, 80,000 views. That was enough of an indicator that, okay, there is interest in this type of content, so they can invest more, they can hire, spend more money on the location, editing, hire, bring on a team, because there is something there. Uh, and I've done the same process with different, you know, nonprofits and personal brands as well. So this is like one of the biggest ones. It has grown to 7 million views and 30,000 subscribers now. And now with this, this is a personal brand that we created on YouTube. It started from one video to test. It's a kid that does science experiments. And our assumption was if we format a video a certain way, that a kid does science experiments. Are there enough people who would watch it? And then if people watch it, is there a way to build a business around it? And by creating probably three videos, we tested the assumption that there are enough people who would watch it, there is enough interest, and this is a good format. And we tweaked it a lot between those three videos based on the feedback we got. And now he's making a lot of money just, you know, getting, doing feature talks at different places because he established himself as an authority on, you know, children and connecting with science. And we'll go through some of the businesses I worked with too as an example. But before we start, probably the most important question for anybody who has come to this workshop is, why should you even bother with mo mocking up your idea? Trying to start from a very basic version of your idea in the first place instead of just, you know, I know what I want to build, I know what my product is, and just going through all of it and then launching it, right? What's the value of this workshop? And I'm gonna use the word called MVP a lot. It stands for Minimum Viable Product. And that's just a fancy way of saying the minimum version of your product that uh, de delivers the basic value, right? So for example, if you are uh, creating, a, you know, Wright Brothers, they wanted to create a plane that flies. So the minimum viable product would be something that flies. That's their basic assumption. They don't need to fly five people. They don't need to fly uh, someone with like a TV in their uh, airplane. These are all extra features that if you try to bother yourself with coming up with all these features that you want to have before you launch, then you get lost in it. You have to first test your basic assumption, which is, does this work? And for them, the most challenging part of it is probably the technology. For you, it might be the marketing side of it. Is there a market for it? And we probably have to come up with a lot of assumptions, and I'll go through a bunch of them, of all these things that will probably be in your blind spot until you launch. So instead of spending all your effort in one go, you do short bursts, and you do a test, and you learn something, you tweak your original idea, you make it better, you launch again, you see how market reacts, how people react to it and g give you feedback and then you go ahead. So this is a pretty good example. It's a funny comic I love showing. So if you imagine this is what users want, right? This is probably where your idea is. Nobody has perfect knowledge. So even if you have already identified the need or pain that people want to, you know, use a platform or use your product, it's not the perfect fit. You still need to tweak it, but you don't know what you don't know but you are on the right track. So this is your idea. Ideally, you want to satisfy that. But the problem is users don't even know exactly what they want. They kind of know what they want, but they don't know the design of it. They're not marketers. They're not graphic designers. They don't understand what has a good business model. They're not a technologist. So they give you some information, but not all of it. And based on that, some information, you will have a basic understanding that, again, it's insufficient. So you have to do a lot of testing. And then you hire some developers, and based on the way you explain your idea to them, they build something that looks like this. Still not good. 
And then you go to a bunch of marketers, you're like, okay, this is my idea, I want you to create you know, marketing copy for it, graphics for it, something that explains it to someone when it, they, hear, they come to our website for the first time or they come to our store for the first time and they put something like this together that really goes overboard with one of the features that probably does or doesn't matter. And then you get your business development team to create a pricing model on it of how we're going to make money on it. And their pricing, money, uh, pricing strategy is based on something super expensive like this. And then ideal product actually looks like this. So you have all these little, you know, kind of far off assumptions. All of them are kind of right in some way, but none of them are actually resemble the ideal product. So the whole idea of going from mock-ups and prototyping and modifying your idea and again testing, launching, testing is to find your way from your original idea to the ideal product. And the assumptions you have usually fall within these three categories. People, you have assumptions about what people want, what people react to, how much people would pay for. Um, and then how the technology works, and the end product, what the end product should look like, and how it should relate, how, what's the business model around it. And you have a bunch of assumptions about that. Everything about your idea is an assumption, it's just in your head, and it's not tested, and it's probably wrong, right? And that's why a lot of people get hung up on their idea. They're like, okay, I'm not gonna share my idea with anyone until I launch. And it's never about your idea. Your idea is probably not as unique as you think. And it, you know, a lot of people have ideas. At the end of the day, what matters is how you execute on it. So if I were you, I really suggest you to share your idea as much as you can to get feedback on it because your idea is probably not the right one. You need to modify it. And the only way to modify it is to put it out there and try to track the feedback that you get to modify it as fast as you can. Cool. So based on all these complicated assumptions, you need a framework. And the basic idea of this framework is this, of how you go from your idea, which is very different from the ideal product, to the ideal product, or something close to it. You don't need to have the ideal product to you know, make it. You just need to be somewhat in the same realm. So first, you have an idea. And by idea, I mean you have to have a very developed idea of what your product or your service is What's the value that it provides? Who does it provide this value? How do they interact with your product to get that value? And how are you gonna make money off of it? Or how is it sustainable even if you're not gonna make money off of it? And then you have to have some planning. Okay, this is my idea. How am I gonna go from an idea to putting it on paper, developing it, understanding what technology is needed to make it real, what legalities is needed to make it real. So now the planning is mostly serious thinking, developing all the different aspects that you need to figure out before you build it. Then you have to build version one, or version two, or version three, and this process probably never stops. So every time you're going through this, stop, this process. So once you build some version of your product, then you wanna track it. And that's the great thing about online businesses and online applications, you can track everything. And that kind of makes this process even more valuable because a lot of it is based on the feedback that you get from your users, your customers, and the more accurate feedback you can get, the better you can modify your product to get closer to the ideal stage. And I'll talk a lot about different tracking tools you can use and different ways you can get feedback from your customers even without talking to them. And then optimizing based on the feedback you get. So first, you have an idea, you plan out how to go about creating it, you create it, you track how people react to it, use it, pay for it or not pay for it. And then based on the feedback, you kind of tweak your original idea. Now you have tweaked your original idea, now you go through the same process, then repeat and repeat. And this way, you're, every time you do this, you can test one of the assumptions or a couple of the assumptions and every time, probably you're getting closer to that ideal stage because you learn something along the way. So the basics. It's very easy, easy when you try to come up with your idea to fall in love with all the different details and features and you probably 
think, okay, this is gonna be the Facebook of this or the Uber of that, and then you try to think of all these features that are involved with it, the colors, the logo, the branding, and what domain you're gonna get, all of this stuff that probably doesn't matter as much as you think until you really launch it and have a very good idea of your product is and have a built version of it. So the trick is to not worry about that stuff and focus on the core value your product offers, right? So what is the actual thing your product has to do to be worthwhile? If it had to do one thing properly, what would that be, right? You haven't started anything. You don't want to focus on five different, six different, ten different features. Just figure out what's the one thing that if your product did properly, it would be usable. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to do something properly that people will say, okay, I'll use it. And once you figure that out, then you're like, okay, my first version or first few versions, I'm just going to perfect this one feature. That if nothing else fall, works, just for the sake of this feature, people will use it. And then you have to keep it simple. And if you're designing a website or a mock-up or anything, it's a good idea to do mobile first. Uh, I'm sure we had a workshop before about web design. And in web design, every time you want to design a website, it's a good idea to design the mobile version first because it kind of forces you to keep everything simple, focus on the basic values and ideas that your product or app or website has to deliver and then you don't get bothered with all these extra features. You don't have enough rope to hang yourself. So before step one, you obviously have to have an idea. And by idea, you have to know what's the pain or the problem that your product is solving, in what way, and why people would pay for it or join it, or why it's a valuable and workable idea. And for that, you have to do a lot of market research, uh, customer research, you have to perfect your elevator pitch so you can explain it to yourself, to your teammates, to people who you want to entice to come on board with you, become your co-founders. They have to be excited about your idea. And if you can't really articulate what your idea is in the first place, you're going to have a very difficult time to get buy-in from investors. Probably at that stage, you don't even want to bother with investors because you don't have anything. But just teammates to get, okay, this is my idea. Are you interested to jump on board? And then once you have that, all this information, then you can start working on your first mock-up, which we'll talk about. Then step two, we're going to focus on how to get ideas about val uh, how valuable your idea is, what are the different competition in the market, what they're lacking, what they're good at, where will your product would fit in the market compared to other, all the other competition. Because no matter what your product is, there is probably some form of competition. And competition doesn't necessarily need to be doing exactly the same thing that your product would do. It just needs to getting the same dollar that the customer is spending instead of using your product. And you have to see how you're going to convince that person to spend it on yours instead of theirs. And if your idea doesn't have any competition, that might be great, but you also have to question a lot of your assumptions. Sometimes when there's absolutely no competition, that means it's not that good of an idea because nobody really does it or I've never managed to do anything like that. So that's something to be, you know, check it out and see if your idea doesn't has any big flaws that you haven't seen. And I'll talk a lot about the uh, different ways that you can get this information. And step three, we're going to talk about target market, the pain, solution, and the value. More focus on that. Cool. So the first step of minimal viable product is from your head to paper. Right? Usually that's how it works. You have an idea in your head. So the first thing you want to do is to get it on paper. Because once you try to put it on paper, then you really have to think about all the details of how it's going to look, what it is. So how many of you know what famous website's mock-up is this? Yeah. This is the guy who created Twitter. This is the first thing he drew on a paper. It's like, OK, I have an idea. This is how I think it's going to look like. It's nothing like what Twitter looks like now. And that kind of goes to the idea of don't get bogged down. Don't think your idea is perfect. Your idea has a long way to go to where it should be. And you have no idea how to know where that place is until you go through a bunch of testing and tweaking and testing and tweaking. So don't fall to the trap of creating the perfect product because you can't. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just you've got to realize that. 
So this was his basic idea for Twitter. And all this mock-up does, it focuses on the core features. And the best way to start is to find the thickest marker you have and draw it on a paper. And why I say thickest marker? Because then you don't bother with the, you know, making it fancy or pretty or you know, going through all the details. Because this is the first version of your mock-up. You want to focus on the key features and what it's actually going to pan out to look like. Cool. This is something I always use. So there are a lot of people out there, and most of them are not going to care about your product, especially when you launch it. They have absolutely no reason to care, because you don't care about other people's products. So the, one of the main gaps you have to bridge is from the idea in your head to the actual product that's going to launch or you know, people use. You have to understand, first of all, who's going to care the most about it, because when you launch, you want to the easiest thing you can get are the people who are going to kill for this product. You're not going to market to everybody. Probably down the road, a lot of people would use it. But initially, your best chance is to figure out who is the core audience that is like, OK, this is something I'll use. Who's your early adopters for that product? And usually, that's the people who, are, who are, have the biggest pain for it. So for example, someone who's creating a lawyer app. So within the lawyer community, what type of lawyers would use that, would really like that app? would really like that service. So that's something you have to figure out. And then based on all this information, then you got to answer these couple of questions of everything you know about the people who are going to use it, and why they care about it, and what they already use instead of your product, and why they need your product, and then how your pro product is really going to connect with their needs and wants and their savviness in technology and other products that they use. And then the final product, how is it going to be positioned in the market compared to everything else? And how it's going to make money or users or be a viable, sustainable idea? So you're going to have a bunch of assumptions with that. So you probably have to write down a lot of sentences under each of them. And these are going to be the assumptions that if all of this is true, then your product is probably going to work. Your assumptions might even be the wrong assumptions, but that doesn't matter. You first have to test them. Now, you got your idea on paper, like the Twitter guy. The next step, once you got a better idea about what it is, is to give it a more professional look. right? So you got the first level of detail. Now we're going to zoom in and add a little bit more detail about interactions and the looks of the website. So this is when you take it from paper to screen. So there are a lot of softwares for free that probably, all, if you have time, I'll go through using them. and. We'll create a mock-up app of something that lets you, you know, go to a decent level of detail. This is not too detailed, right? It doesn't have any colors. It doesn't have any cool fonts or anything. And it's good because you don't want to bother with that stuff yet. You're still trying to figure out what your idea is. So this lets you figure out, OK, this is how it's going to look like. And you don't need to be you know, the king of inter user interface or user interaction. You just need to look at what other people are using, what your target audience is already using. right? That's a good way to go about it. And say, OK, these people are familiar with this type of interface. What's the closest thing to the interface that would kind of work with my product? And try to get a lot of inspiration from that. And I say inspiration, but that's kind of you know, stealing. You don't have to copy them, but that would give you a lot of clues about what's the best way to create that mock-up. Cool. And the point of this, it's a little bit of a thinner market, so you have more detail. And it's a lot to do with the experience details. And you have, want to get validations. This is a good thing to go and show to you know, your lawyer friends or some developer or some designer and say, hey, what do you think of this? And the developer would tell you, well, actually, you know, this is something cool. If you build it like this, it would work. So this is something that you can get somewhat a meaningful feedback from experts of your field. Then level three, these mockups, you're getting feedbacks. And based on the feedback, you learn more. Then you're like, OK, I'm going to get more detailed. I have a little bit of more confidence about what my idea is. So I have most of the details down. OK, this is good. Next version. Now you're going to get more detailed. And by detailed, I mean you really want to mock up your product the way it's going to look. And how it's going to look, what colors, 
what branding, what's the user inter interactions going to be like, the logo, if you really want to spend time on it. But the other thing to keep in mind, logo is not that important as much as you think. It's not that important to spend that much time on it. Best logos that you can think of are usually typefaces. They don't have any fancy you know, graphics beside them. You know, TD, Coca-Cola, BMO, Ryerson, uh, YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter. Most of their logo is just a typeface. They, most of them didn't start like that, but after a while, they just kept their typeface. And now a lot of people are just keeping with that, and it doesn't make that much difference as you think. So don't spend that much time trying to find the perfect logo if you're not happy with it or don't feel comfortable with it or figuring out the perfect colors. Th those stuff are secondary, even not that. So the point of this is uh, you're going to use a bunch of, again, online tools to create your actual realistic mock-up of your product. It's, again, more focus on experience, de uh, details of the uh, user experience, getting more validations. So now, since your product is more realistic, you can't even go to the people who are not as expert-like and don't understand you know, the technical mock-ups compared to realistic mock-ups. So once you have a realistic mock-up, you can talk to a lot of more people and get better feedback from them of, OK, what do you think of this? So we'll talk with some of the tools to create something like this. Then you have a detailed mock-up, right? But still, it's on paper. So like it doesn't do anything. It's just a nice picture of your product. Then you want to figure out the functional version of it without coding, which is pretty tricky. But fortunately, over the past few years, there have been a lot of cool software that lets you create functional mockups. And by functional, I don't mean it actually does the thing that you want it to do at the end of the day, but it looks as if it does it. So if you click the different buttons, it goes to those pages. If you create, if you press some button, it does certain pop-ups, or like imagine an Uber app that does everything except connected to the outside world. It shows a guy coming after to pick you up, but there's absolutely no one there. It's just a light, nice little animation. It's as real as it gets without being real. And I'll talk about a couple of applications that you can make something like that. So this is something I made with that application probably five minutes, uh, trying to create something like Uber for trucks. Had to come up with something. So again, with this, it's very easy to get distracted with all the fancy details. So it's important to keep it simple. Always have that. Through all this process, you just want to keep it simple. And at every step, know what your focus is. What are you focusing on? Is it the design or is it the interactions? Is it the key feature? Probably when you're starting, you just want to figure out what that feature is and would people understand how to use your website to get that value from that feature. And then um, we'll get a lot more validation from this. Because then, if it's functional, you can put it in front of someone who can use it and say, OK, see if you can use it. And then they're like, OK, I can't make sense of your app. Or this is too complicated. Or I already have other app that does something very similar to this. I don't want to use this. So, so far, you haven't paid anyone to develop this. You haven't really paid any designer to create this. So if you get feedback like that, then you're not at that big of a loss of time and investment of money and other people's time to create a product that doesn't work, right? That is the benefit of this, doing, going through this process, is you get a lot of the feedback without investing all that time and money in developing and designing an app that nobody would want to use or has a big flaw that you never thought it would have. So once you have a functional prototype that you're happy with based on the feedback, then you can go to a live mock-up. And a live mock-up is, again, very similar to the functional prototype. But this one is live. So you have a URL. You can put it up there. And it acts more as like a pre-sign up. You just want to gauge interest. You just want to see if people go through it, see your pricing, uh, would be interested in it. You want to see how many people would say, OK, yeah, sign me up, give you their, uh, give you their email. right? Because everybody might say, oh, yeah, I'm very interested in this. And the next time you ask them, OK, do you want to pay 100 bucks for this, then they're like, no. So you still don't want to build it, but you still want to make it as real as possible, put it up there, and drive traffic to it different ways. We'll talk about that as well. And see how people react to it. You can buy Google Ads, Facebook Ads to your page. People read about the product, can test it out, look at it, the interface, look at the mock-ups. It's as real as it gets. 
and then you see how many people click on the buy button or the sign up button. And then you're like, okay, I spent some money, $50, $100, drove like 2,000 people to my page. Nobody signed up. Why is that? It's good to know before you actually, again, invest all that money in developing and designing it, right? You still haven't designed or developed anything in reality. You just made some mockups, created a functional app in like an hour to, of your time just to test it out. And now, again, there are ways to get feedback from the users and track why they wouldn't sign up or they wouldn't pay. Maybe it's your pricing. Maybe your product description is too confusing or it doesn't connect with the audience that you thought it would connect. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna tweak the, this aspect of it, see if it performs better or not. And then you tweak stuff, you see, okay, 50 people signed up, 100 people signed up, 500 people signed up. You're like, okay, I think I got down the way I'm gonna present my product to people to get them excited about signing up for it or pur purchasing it. And then you can think about creating a live product. Because now you have already figured out the best way to create it, figured out the core value that your product delivers and best way to present it to customers, <coughs> figured out the best way to price it, figured out the best way to describe it to, uh, to your audience, and got a lot of experience in terms of driving traffic, who your audience is, what they care about, what they don't care about, what should your you know, uh, pitch be, and now you can pitch it to different, and you can, now you have a list of people who gave you their email. They're like, oh yeah, I wanna buy this. I wanna sign up for this. And then you show that to a developer. You're like, hey, I have this idea. I did this, a thousand people signed up. Do you wanna help me build it? Then they would, it would be much easier to get them on board. You show it to a designer. You're like, hey, there are 5,000 people who are interested in this. I haven't built it, designed it or anything, but if you wanna be my co-founder, I think there's something to this. That will get them way more excited. You want to ask someone for money to help you develop your idea? It would be a much more powerful pitch once you say, I have 5,000 people who gave me their email saying, yes, I want this product. And it's very good because when you launch, you have that email list of people who have said, I'm interested in your product. So you can email them and say, we are actually live now. So you're not just launching and waiting for people to come. Right? So now you build it, it's always good to focus even when you launch on that one key feature. What is your product supposed to do? What's the one thing, if it does, people will use it. They're not gonna be 100% happy with it, but they're like, you know, I use this. It's not the perfect product, but it solves my problem and I'm gonna use it. So find that one feature and then launch. Once you perfect that feature, you're happy with it, you're performing to the level that you want it, then you can repeat the process for the second one, third one, and develop your idea further and further. And then a lot of this comes down to tracking and analyzing how people are reacting to your product. So we're gonna talk about all of this stuff. So yeah, obviously level seven is after your live product, you're gonna repeat this whole process to fine tune and fine tune furthermore. Cool, how many of you have your laptops or anything to go online with? Put your hands up higher so I can see it. Okay, that's way more than it looked first, so good. Um, so if you go to this link, bit.ly, bit.ly, MVP links, there will be a page with a ton of links that, about all the tools that I talked about, so I'm gonna go through them. And cool thing about bit.ly is, it's, uh, how many of you know bit.ly? It just makes your links shorter. You can track how many people have clicked on your link. So, so far four of you, including myself, so three of you have gone to the page. Hopefully more of you will end up there, but I'll just go through some of them. And you can go this, uh, through this at home. And I've categorized them in different sections of all these different stuff that we talked about. So the first one is market research, right? So how are you gonna find a semi-reliable way of checking how much interest is there for your idea or product. What else are people are using? And what other kind of products are you know, getting related to your product? So my favorite, one of the favorite ones is Google Trends. Google knows everything, right? People go and search for what they want. That's pretty much what Google is. You want to know something, you want to buy something, you go to Google, search for it, 
you find the information. So it's pretty reliable to really know what people are actually trying to find. And they have this thing called Google Trends, where you can go and say, let's say blockchain, right? Since you said blockchain. I want to see blockchain. Is it a dying trend? Is it like going up, going down? Is it like good market for me to get into? This is not, you know, this is not going to answer all of that question, but it's one of the ways to figure out one aspect of it. So blockchain. And blockchain is a pretty unique word that people are not going to use it for other things. So whatever result I get, it's probably people searching for the same blockchain that I'm talking about. It's a kind of technology. So let's see. Cool. So this is a pretty good market to get in, apparently, based on this, right? So there was pretty much no one searching for this until 2012, and now more and more people are searching for it. So there is a rising interest in this market. So it's not a dying market. It's not something that was popular three years ago and it's been going down since then. So at least from that front, I'm covered. And then down here, it gives you even more information of which areas are disproportionately interested in blockchain. It's not always accurate but it's still good to look at. And then you want to see what else people search for when they search for blockchain. This is actually very important because if you have a product, then you're going to see, OK, people search for this, but I don't know what else people search with blockchain. Blockchain what? Blockchain crowdfunding or blockchain accounting? Which one people are searching for? And this gives you a lot of good ideas about that. So blockchain. Bitcoin, blockchain wallet, blockchain BTC, which is again Bitcoin. Rising searches are the searches that are recently getting super popular. Bitcoin wallet, uh, blockchain download. Might not give you the best information, but it's always, it takes a couple of minutes to get a lot of information about the market. Topics that people search for, so probably these are the topics that you want to know about if you want to get into market. Coinbase, which is like a company that uses blockchain for Bitcoin. Uh, and then blockchain.info, another company. So that's pretty good info. Uh, who else has a good topic they want to check? Let's see. Vaporizers. That's one of my friends that's telling me. So, or e cigarette, what do you call it? E, whoops. Cool. Right? This is a pretty rising market. At least it's not dying. So that's another good way to know if there's a rising interest. Which places there are people more interested in it? Uh, what other people? What other things people search for? Uh, how different ways people try to name it? Right? So if you want to, down the road, get a domain name, describe your product in a certain way, it really helps if you describe it and get a domain name the same way people search for it. Because it might be called electronic cigarette, like the proper way to say it, but then people just say e-cig or e-liquid for the thing. So these are different topics that people search for. Nicotine, juice, vapor, uh, flavor, rising searches. So that's one of the tools. Cool. Next one is Dribble. And this is kind of, I like to think about it as Google Trends, but for design. This is where the most talented designers in the world come and show off their design skills. And now why this is good, because you can get a lot of ideas from it. I'm horrible with figuring out colors and design. But if you come here, you can get a lot of good ideas. So let's say. Lawyers app, right? I want to see the latest apps for designing in terms of law. Law, how do they look like? So a lot of people do put their mockups of their app, right? Profile for lawyers, right? So they have colors, they have designs of different interface of how it works. It might not have anything to do with what you want to design, but this is a good place to come and do a little bit of research to first see what are the best ways to design an app. What are the good interfaces that are starting to trend, because this is the cutting edge stuff. This is like the latest stuff that designers are putting out. So you understand if 
you're not a designer, at least where the design is going. What are the different functionalities that are getting added to the apps? And also, what other people are creating? These are most of them are real applications, real websites. So you also learn a lot about your competition of what's getting, who, what are the latest companies people are starting to work on to launch. So you might come across of a lot of your competition. So let's search for blockchain again. Blockchain app. Probably Bitcoin app would be better. Uh, Bitcoin app. Cool. And I'm sure if you search for Bitcoin crowdfunding, you might even find something. So let's do that. Crowdfunding. Nothing. But crowdfunding, because it probably wouldn't uh, be that different in terms of interface, because the blockchain is probably the technology of it. P2P crowdfunding, let's see. Um, well, I guess blockchain implies P2P. Let's just see what blockchain has. So yeah, you can even say app. So I, this one gives you a logo of someone. It's not about an interface, but you also get an idea about who's coming into the market. You can check them out. You can get a lot of information. So there are a lot of links in this document. And all of them are supposed to get, help you get more information about the market you're getting into, what products are there, what people are already using, and kind of refine your original idea before you put anything on paper down. You're like, OK, I have this idea. Before bothering to even create something on a paper, you first want to really understand your own idea. And the best way is to see what else is out there and how similar your idea is to them. What ways can you kind of see parallels between your idea and what other people are doing? Cool. Product Hunt. How many of you know Product Hunt? OK, how many of you know Reddit? Cool. So basically, Product Hunt is a website when someone launches a product or a service, or even now books and blog posts, but mostly in tech industry. They come and share it, and other people vote on it. They're like, OK, that's a pretty cool product. And the most votes you get, the higher you get on this massive list of all the products. So hopefully, once you actually launch, or even with your live mock-up, which you haven't launched, you're just getting pre-sign-ups, it's a good idea to post it on Product Hunt. Because this is where a lot of technology-savvy people who would be comfortable with trying a new product that is you know, not performing perfectly, would sign up to try it. A lot of your competition is going to be here too, so you have to be careful. But here you can see, OK, let me see what startups have recently launched about blockchain. And whoops, blockchain. And brings you all these different webs, uh, websites or products and services that have used uh, blockchain in their description. And then let's see if there are any blockchain crowdfunding. Crowd, no. Maybe Bitcoin crowdfunding. Yeah, so there you go. There are a bunch of places that have said, OK, this has to do something with Bitcoin and crowdfunding. So you can check them out, see what they are doing, how you can be different from them, how you can be better than them. And if you can't, then why are you even bothering to make one, another one, right? If they're already doing a good job, if people are already using it and are happy with it, and you're just going to make an identical or a slightly inferior product, how, what's the rationale behind that, right? So this will give you a lot of ideas about that. Next one is Quora. How many of you know Quora? It's like a proper Yahoo Answers, right? So you can ask questions, and you can even read other people's questions. That's probably, you don't even need to really ask questions. You want to see what other people are asking in your market. This will give you a lot of good ideas about what are the hot conversations in the field that you're trying to enter, right? If you're doing a blockchain crowdfunding, what are the big topics that people have questions about or talking or discussing about peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding. What are the problems they're facing? Who else is in it? Who are the you know, people who really know a lot about this stuff? Because then you can see who is the most person who gave like, the best answers within this certain topic. 
You can reach out to them to get some feedback. You can bring them on as a team member maybe or an advisor or a mentor. So let's see. P2P crowd funding. Is there a plug and play P2P crowdfunding platform? So someone asked this and then someone gave this massive answer with a bunch of links, right? That's a pretty cool answer. You can, and then they have topics. You're like, okay, I want to just see what are the uh, best questions people have asked in terms of crowdfunding, right? It's a kind of pre-made Google search for you with proper answers. And when you ask a question, there's a very good chance that someone very legitimate will answer your questions. A lot of people from Facebook are here. A lot of people from you know, Twitter, all these people who are big high-level startups and companies that would come and answer your question if you ask a specific one, that are expert in their field, and they'll come and answer. I think Obama even answered the question here. So it's an exceptional platform for you to get detailed answers, detailed insight in your market, in your especially the technology aspect of things, and understand what are the main conversations in your field. Because if you want to create a product in your field and be successful, you at very least have to have expert level knowledge of what's important in that field. What are the you know, key make or break things that matter? So I love Quora. You can just browse and you'll come across a lot of good conversations. Whoops, cool. So that's one way to figure out, uh, uh, market, do your market research. Uh, there are a couple of more ways. I'm not gonna go too in depth with this one, but again, Google is one of the best places to find information. And if you know how to use Google in a proper way, you're gonna get way more. So let's say I've already found Quora. I don't like their search. Their search is not perfect, right? So I wanna search Quora using Google. I can tell Google, find all the searches, all the pages in Quora that mention blockchain, and crowdfunding. And this does bring all of that. So it will be possible to create blockchain-based crowdfunding. That's a pretty good answer. Let's check that out. So there are all these people who have answered this question. And a lot of them are researchers or academics or even technologists that really know what they're talking about and give you a very detailed answer. So one of the links I have in this page goes through a lot of these different ways that you can use Google to get better answers and more specific uh, results instead of getting lost in all the results. So you can go through them uh, in your own pace and try them based on what you need to find out. Cool. Now let's get to creating a basic uh, mock-up. For basic mock-up, there's this website called Balsamic. There are a ton of them. I really like these guys because it keeps everything super simple. So it's perfect for the first version. And all you have to do is to create, click download, it will download, and then let me see if they have any screenshots that I can show you. So yeah, you remember that uh, mock-up I had on my page? So it's pretty much drag and drop. So you're like, okay, I need a map somewhere in my app or website and pops up a map, you're like, okay, put it here, you drag it with your mouse. It's very easy to use. You absolutely need no technical knowledge or design skills or coding skills. You just drag and drop. It's like a piece of puzzle. You put it together. You're like, okay, this is the basic thing that I have in mind. You turn your pen and paper mock-up into a decently designed mock-up, right? For most of us who don't have good design skills, this is perfect. Um, Right, so they have anything from apps to websites uh, to dashboards. So it does pretty much all of that. Now, once you're done with that, whoops, then you want to go one level up. A little bit more detailed mock-up. And let's go do it. So SketchUp is a little bit more technical, but has some learning curve but it gives you a lot of templates. So by templates, I mean you're like, okay, the app I wanna create is very similar to Uber. And they have already created a mockup of Uber. And then you can download that template and then kind of modify it. And that will give you a realistic mockup of your app. It's as if like a real 
quality app on iPhone or Android. So let's see. And most of them come with a free trial. So you can just try and see what it is and you can get most of what you want to do within that trial period or with the trial features. So I'll go after we're done through a couple of these apps. But just to show you all these uh, different sources you can use. Um, let's go. Cool. Once you want to launch your app, you're going to need a lot of you know, graphic design, mock-ups, you know, the first landing page you want to put together, the first uh, kind of design package you want to put together to have a presentable uh, version of your app to someone that you're like, okay, this is my idea. You need a lot of graphics. And this website just gives you exactly that. So you're like, okay, Facebook reactions, right? I want something like Facebook reactions, but I want to edit it. So this website gives you a Photoshop version or an editable version of Facebook Reactions, the interface element of Facebook Reactions, and then you can modify it. So if you're designing something that has something similar to this, then you can use this as a base to design your own thing instead of creating something from scratch. So basically, it's a, generally, it's a good idea to never design something from scratch when you're going through this process because you're just piecing together all these different stuff and the quality is not that important as much as you trying to learn something from the result. So if you're going to use, it's not going to 100% resemble what you have in mind, but basically does the job, it's better to use something that's already made. Or Instagram. So your app is going to be similar to Instagram. You don't want to design it yourself. This gives you a template of the Instagram. You download it, and then you modify it saves you so much time, your design will look so much more professional without hiring a designer or spending that much time on a design. Even if you want to hire a designer, you can give them this and then say, okay, modify it this way. So it makes their job easier, makes your job easier, and it's a great stepping stone. So all, you have all these links in uh, that page that I sent you. Um, there's even websites for getting, you know, dummy pictures of users. So if you have a website or an app that's really based on users and you want to put realistic pictures of people who are your users, this website just does that. It gives you all these things. So you can say, you know, I want someone with like a big picture or a circle. Uh, I want a circular profile picture. Uh, big spacing between them or not. So anything you can think of, probably there is a way to do it without actually going through doing everything from scratch yourself. So always Google before going and creating anything from scratch. Probably you should never in this process try to create anything from scratch because that would be a waste of your time. Cool. Uh, logos. I love this because, as I said, a lot of people spend their time creating logos. And this is a logo generator, and it's just good enough logo, right? So you can say, oh, I have a thing that has, uh, let's see if they have anything with law. So you're like, okay, I'm designing something that is for lawyers, and I'm going to put a simple thing like this. And what's the name of your app? Scribe. Scribe. Sorry? Scribe. Okay. Cool. And boom. Or here. That's a logo. It's good enough to launch. Doesn't need to be perfect. There's the other one that does the same thing. So, uh, or you can say scribe. It's always a good idea to type all caps when you want to write your logo. So it doesn't look like a normal text. Du, du, du. Doesn't work. Let me change this. Probably going to look much better. And you have a bunch of options to make it you know, more fancy if you want, but it just does that much. Not as much as you know, going too detailed, but again, you just want a mock-up. This is not your final product. Your logo can change, will always change. 
Yes. Uh, the one square space, but for some reason it's not going through, but it's very similar to this one. It just creates a logo for you based on your name. It says, okay, what's the name? And then put like three keywords that are related to it. And based on those keywords, put some like graphic beside it. That's it. Oh, this is uh, Squarespace. So if you go to that link, I have a list of all these websites. So you're not going to miss any of them. And here we go. Cool. Magic Mockups is a great website. So let's say, let's go to a website, a random website. Let's say, let's say this is your website. This is like the interface that you have designed with all these tools. You're like, this is like a mock-up of it, right? So I'm just going to take a screenshot of this. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to put a landing page. If I'm going to look like a legitimate company that has a legitimate product, I should have like very nice pictures of you know, my product and computers on iPhones or whatever. And this just does that. So you select one of these pictures. You're like, okay, this looks great it's that I can use on a, my website. And then you upload your picture and boom, puts it right there. Right? Didn't do anything. It's free. And it looks like you hired like a professional designer to design this for you or you actually took a really good photo. <coughs> but let's do a bit of proper website so you can really see product hunt. Or YouTube.com. YouTube is great. Cool. Or let's actually do with this. This is much fancier. Cool. Right? Pretty nice. Now, for the apps, you can exactly do the same thing. So let's take a screenshot of Uber, the app. Oh, I think this is great. Save image. So this is something you create with those tools that we talked about. Sketch, all these different ones. Uh, let's see. Great, OK. So let's say this is the mock-up of your first page of your app that you came up with. And you want to create a very nice looking mock-up. You go through this website, you're like, okay, this is a nice phone. This would be great for my ads or professional pictures that I want to use. Boom. Right? No graphic design, no design skill, no coding, nothing. And you get a very good looking mock-up of your app. And then you can use this in your landing page. If you have Facebook ads, Google ads, all these different places, you want to create a brochure or PowerPoint or a pitch deck explaining it to someone, doing this will make it look so much more professional with practically like one minute of your time, even not that. And there are a bunch of these websites. So I've added a few of them. There's another one called Dunk. So they have even like Apple Watch. If you're making an Apple Watch, you can do that. Or tablets. So let's do it. Right? Pretty cool. Without any extra work. Uh, if you're trying to sell something, how many of you want to sell a product? Cool. How many of you know Shopify? It's a great platform. It's perfect because it lets you focus on what you have to do instead of worrying about the technology side of things. It has a fantastic platform for you to sell stuff. It works. It's optimized, it loads fast, it's beautiful. People are already using it, can make sense of the purchase process. And then you can just focus on perfecting your marketing, perfecting your product positioning, your copy, your pictures, and all that stuff, instead of worrying about, oh, is my hosting right, or is my domain connected to my hosting? Why is my WordPress plugins not working? All these stuff that will take a lot of your time when you actually have to spend time working on sales, marketing, and uh, iterating on your product. OK, and the last one. Once you have a good idea of what your product is, you have created a bunch of these graphics, then it's a good idea to create a landing page. By landing page, I mean a one-pager website that you can show to people, say, hey, this is my website. Would you sign up? You just send it to a bunch of your friends. You send it to a bunch of people. You post it on Product Hunt. 
you buy $50 of you know, Facebook ads or Google ads to drive traffic to it and see how people react to it. Would they sign up for it? Would they click buy? Or would they come to it and they kind of get confused and they leave? And for that, you don't need, again, any coding really because you're not trying to create the perfect landing page. You just want to create something that gives you actionable insights. And for that, there are a bunch of different apps that let you create these type of landing pages with the graphics that you created using those websites and the mockups that you created using those tools and the copy and information and sales pitch that you got from your Google research, your Quora research, all those stuff, and the logo that you created using that tool. Once you put all of that together, then you can create a nice landing page. So I probably don't have time to go through create one from scratch, but honestly, it takes probably 20 minutes. Once you have everything putting it together with these stuff, it's drag and drop. So I'll just show you the interface because a lot of people get intimidated by this stuff, but you just create, create new page. And let me see if we have that picture perfect. So save. Cool. So it's loading. Good. So now you can just change images. Um, let's upload the picture we just made there. Save. Well, this is embarrassing. Oops. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK, there you go. Cool. And then you can delete these stuff so you don't need them. So that one is like an Uber thing for trucks. You can say, based on your research, moving has Never been easier. Obviously, your landing page is going to look much better with better mockups and all that. But I'm just going through how easy it is to add a picture and you know add your text, create your buttons. Call to action basically means what you want people to do after they come to your beautiful landing page. And it's probably to sign up for your service, give you their email. This can be something, OK, we haven't launched yet. Or you can kind of say that we have launched. Are you interested in signing up? So, let's see. I think I lost the, oh, here. Cool. So yeah, and then you can write down the features that your apps has, how it solves the problem that the person has. So people come to your website, like, okay, what is this about? Moving has never been easier. That gives them some basic idea of, okay, this is something about moving. I like that. I'm interested. Then they are like, okay, you save money because it's like Uber. You don't pay like extra fees. Um, fast growing company probably not. This not relevant. 24 hour support. All these stuff that you want. Then you can change and modify all this stuff. Yes. Can you use some of those images legally for commercial purposes? Yeah. So all the tools that I'm showing you, all of them give you commercially legally pro uh, pictures to use. Now you might want to use something like this, right? So that's good because there's a website called Noun Project. So it's very good to use icons to explain different, different aspects of your app, right? So this probably really helps that they have these really good looking icons that someone looks at, they get a basic idea of the paragraph, and then they read it. So now you probably have very specific like, icons that you need. You need something about blockchain, for example, right? So how do you get a free, legally usable icon about blockchain? There's this amazing website called Noun Project. And basically their idea is if there's a noun, we want to make an icon set for it. And you can use it legally. So let's say, I'm pretty sure they have blockchain. So let's see, blockchain. There you go, they have blockchain, right? It's not the prettiest icon, but it's workable. It's something you can use in your mockup that people will make sense of, and you can just download it and use it there. So basically, it's as easy as downloading it from here, uploading it there, and then writing that paragraph. It's not the best landing page, but it's still good enough to give you a lot of information. 
Cool. So we have that. We built our landing page. Then you want to collect emails, right? At very least. If you haven't launched a product that people can actually log in to use or click to buy, but they're interested in it, they came to your website, you don't want them to just leave because at some point you're going to launch and have a product and have an offering that you want them to use. So the least you can do is to have an open line of communication with them. So when you do launch, you can let them know that, hey, we're live, come on. So usually what people do is they ask them to give them their email. You can ask people to give you their email, but you can do other things. The whole point of this is not to just get their email. It is to have an open form of communication with them. It can be asking them to join a Facebook group that you have. In my opinion, a lot of times it's better to ask someone to join your Facebook group, a closed Facebook group you have, to get updates about the product. That depends really how well that idea ties into your actual idea of product. Probably wouldn't work for lawyers. They don't want to join a Facebook group. But for you know, someone who create, wants to create a social app or a you know, fun app or a tool, you're like, hey, we have a Facebook group. We will give access to early users. And that will give you a very good form of communication with all these people to get instant feedback from them. Because it's Facebook. You can ask questions. People will answer. And if you're hitting your target audience, your core audience that's super excited about this and they don't mind your product is not perfect, they'll be using it. And since they're using it for free, you're like, OK, all you have to do is to join this Facebook group and be part of the conversation. And we'll give you lifetime free access or something like that, some incentive. And you have the best valuable form of feedback you can get. And then one, you have, you get, yeah, not only you have communication, you also have feedback. But let's say, in most cases, at the very least, you want to get someone's email. And there's this platform called MailChimp. There are a ton of them like this. Uh, but this one, in my opinion, is the best one. It's super simple. It integrates with all these different websites that it suggested. So I'm pretty sure if you go to Instapage, they have like an integration with MailChimp. So MailChimp. There you go. So they're like, yeah, if you made your landing page with us, you do one click, it connects with your MailChimp account, and we'll give you a box on your landing page that people can type their email and will get added to your MailChimp account. MailChimp basically keeps the list of all the people who have given your emails and lets you send emails to all these people. It's probably not a good idea to do it from your own personal email account to send like 200 emails, right? Because that's spamming. And you, it's, uh, it's really weird to get that type of email, like all, everybody BCC'd. And MailChimp gives you a lot more ability to say, hey, hi, John, and give all these, like, add someone's first name in the email. So a lot of these customizations gives you information of how many people opened it, how many people clicked on a link that you had there. So since you're tracking all this stuff, it's really worthwhile to use a platform that gives you extra information about all these different, different things you can track. Now, talking of tracking, let's say you have that landing page and people are coming to it. Now, you want to see how people are really connecting with that landing page, right? So you got your landing page. People are coming to it. The most important part of your whole process is to be able to track this stuff, right? So now, how do you track the people who come to your website or your landing page? These are my two favorite tools. Uh, favorite because most of their services is free. So for you, it doesn't cost a penny. So let me log into my Why don't we test this? So I have a website called mybumper.co, right? So if anybody's here, why don't you go to the website right now, and I'll show you how this works. So I've added the code from woopra.com to my website. This will let me track every single person who comes to the website, see how much time they spent on, where they came from, which country or city they're in. Uh, even which network they're connected in. Did they come from a laptop? Did they come from a tablet? Did they come from a home computer? What browser they were running? Uh, all these extra information that would be very valuable, some of them, based on whatever reason you're tracking all this stuff. So let's see. See, one person is there. And let's see what they have. So it, whoever this person is, 
You want to click on some links or pages, that would be a good idea, because then we can show how that works. Du, du, du. So it's probably an Android phone, version 5, using Chrome browser in Canada, in Toronto. And these are the pages that I've been to. They clicked on the learn more. And it keeps track of all of them. So there's another person. I guess that was the same person. No, there are two people now. Yeah, so that's one version of it. And it keeps a rolling track of all these people who have come to your website, where they came from. It. Did they just type it in, or was there some other website who was linking to your website? Yeah. So yes, I do it, but usually I use this for when you're launching something uh, fresh. And the reason I do that, I love Google Analytics. But first of all, Google Analytics, you really get the value from it if you spend a lot of time building your own dashboard. Right? So it's very com it's not I mean it gives you some basic information, but it's complicated. The other problem with it is it doesn't track based on IP. It just get, tells you like five people came to the website. It doesn't tell you five people came to the website one of them who was from Canada running an Android uh, phone uh, spent like 10 seconds on the website today, went through these pages. It just says five people came to your website, two of them went to this page, one of them clicked on this button. It doesn't tell you like down to a person. But this not only does this, but also I can see how this person has come to my website since December 23rd. Right? Every time they have come to my website, I can see how they have come. And the coolest thing is, for you, since you don't have that much traffic coming in, that's actually good. Because, for example, you have a lawyer friend, right? You're like, hey, go to my website, check it out. You're on the phone with him, and you're like, oh, he popped up here. You're like, awesome. I'm going to name him John. And now, anytime he comes to the website, as long as he's using the same device and doesn't clear his cookies, you can see he comes to the website. What does he do? Where does he go? And if you think this is creepy, wait till you see the next tool. So this is a pretty cool tool, and it's amazing that it's free. And I don't know what kind of information you're going to get from this that's valuable to you, but tracking as much information as you can within whatever scope you want to get some information is very important. So everything you want to do, it's really good to beforehand figure out, if I'm using this platform, how much of the stuff that happens on it is trackable, right? If you're using a landing page software that doesn't let you add your own tracking, probably it's a good idea to look for another one. If you're using a mail service that doesn't give you enough information about how many people clicked in on it, how many people opened it, it's probably not a good idea because then you send one series of newsletters. Let's say you got like uh, 500 people who signed up, right? You don't want to send the same email to all 500 and hope they'll like it. You want to send I don't know, uh, one type of email with certain headline at a certain time to 100 of them, see how many people won't open it up. And then another type of email, tweak it a little bit, different headline, same time to another 100. And now you're testing which headline grabs the most attention, connects better. And uh, MailChimp or some similar platform would tell you how many people opened it, how many people clicked on it. So you can perfect your pitch. Just so It's like a mini mock-ups to try a launch version of it within your mailing. So everything you do, go through this idea of basic idea, test it, optimize. And the last tool, which is probably my favorite one, is called Hotjar. Because no matter how much you track this stuff, if you have a website, you want to really see, can people use your platform? And if they can, how do they use it? If you have a button that's very important, you hope everybody who comes to your website clicks on it, you really have to hope that they, first of all, see it. They don't skip over it. Because if you have a button and a lot of people don't click on it, it can be a bunch of reasons. It can be you didn't convince them that it's a good idea to click on it. It can be because they didn't see it in the first place to click on it. It can be a bunch of reasons. So the only way to figure out which one of, these, which one of it is this is to sit behind their shoulder and watch how they go through your website. But you can't do that when someone is visiting your website unless you have a tool like Hotjar. So let me log in. Again, all these tools, there are a ton of them. But what I love about this, it's free. For the most part. 
cool. So again, same website. So let me just go to my bumper. So I have different pages, right? So this is our home page. Now this is a heat map. I can see where people click the most, right? So there are a ton of buttons here, like all these little dots that you see are places people clicked. If there's a lot of like uh, dots and the color is closer to red, that means a lot of people click there. And I can go down and see, okay, there's a video here, a lot of people clicked on that, that's good, I want them to click on that. Uh, we have an Instagram thing that nobody clicks on. So should I take it out if no one takes it out? Maybe, yeah, why should I have it there if it doesn't achieve its purpose? Or maybe I can figure out how to get people to click on it. Because the less stuff you have, the better, right? Any extra things you can cut up, the better. If something that doesn't work and you can't make it work, take it out if it's not necessary. But if it's necessary, then you have to really figure out how to make it work. And then a lot of people click on the pictures, uh, different pictures of the product. So what action I, item I get from this is, if I have pictures, they better be really good pictures. Because people really care about the, the, uh, these pictures, they really go through them, they really check them out. So I should, it's a good idea to invest time to get high quality pictures because based on this, it's really important to people, right? And now you can even say, okay, if someone comes from a tablet, what buttons do they click on? And this is pretty important because if someone goes on a mobile phone on your website or a tablet or a desktop, they might not see the same version of your website, right? This is the mobile version. The insights I'm gonna get from this, which is a totally different website, when you shrink the screen size, this is how, if your screen is small, this is how our website would show up. If your screen is desktop size, this is how it would show up, completely different. And we did it because based on the feedback we got following these things of the people on the phone, how they go through the website compared to other people. And then you can see scroll. How far do people scroll, right? So anything below here, 50% of people will never see it, right? So if you have something very important down here, 50% of your people don't see it. What that means is if you put it up there, 50% more people will see it. That way you already increase the number of people who are going to click on it anyways because more people will see it. And you would never know this unless you have this tool. Anything below here, 75% of people would never scroll, 25% uh, of people would never scroll down below it. Now on desktop, it's a different story because they have a bigger screen, they have an easier way to scroll down. So 75% scroll down to here, and then 50%, and then 25%. Now, another interesting thing is people, when they go to a website, a lot of people read with their mouse, right? They kind of scroll underneath the text or put their mouse where the text they want to read is. So, so this, all these things you see is where the mouse have been. So I can see, okay, a lot of people go here. So this is a pretty cool picture. It gets their attention, right? Where your mouse things goes, that's probably where your attention is. So based on this, I'm probably gonna move this higher up because this is something they stop and look at. And if they stop and look at, that's a good thing, I think. Uh, this, they don't really care. Text, blah, blah, blah. Testimonial, they don't even bother with it. Again, Instagram, it's like, you know, they don't even go close to it for some reason. But everything else is good. But even this is not enough because I'm having a lot of assumptions about what all of this means, of why someone put their mouse there or why they didn't put someone their mouse there. Have recordings. So I can actually watch people going through my website. And that's why you should be careful when you go to other websites and they ask you to put the credit card number on their own website instead of going to a third party's website, they can read your credit card number. So this is someone we spent 10 minutes, probably, I don't know who, but we want to watch their thing. So it's Windows 7, Chrome, Desktop. So based on this information, I can uh, uh, collaborate, uh, corral, corroborate this information with the WooPress stuff. So I can put all this information together and really understand who it is. So this is the person, they're very fascinated by this picture. So let's see if I can skip the pauses. So it's just gonna go through it. 
So I can see how this person is going through my website. By itself is not that important because it's just one person. But then you spend time watching 100 people going through your website, then you really understand what people understand about your website. And it's good because you're the last person who would have a clear idea of how your website works. Yes? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, uh, apps, uh, a lot of developers use it because you really want to know, you, like when you launch a new feature, for example, you don't know how people are going to use it. And the only way to know is this. Like that's the best way, to, as close as you can get about like uh, once it drags the line after it looks like a psychotic person. But it's very important to know this stuff, yeah. Well, yes, kind of, because that place is like United Kingdom, right? Some place, sometimes you see a, like a weird place, and a lot of the VPNs that people use are from known IPs. So you, th there are play like you can say, okay, yeah, this is like a VPN ID. So that's how like Netflix or all, a lot of other websites, Hulu, know if you're trying to trick them, because a lot of these services have certain known IPs that are trackable but it's a little bit of more work. So let's see what else I have. Let's go to the next person. And then the cool thing about this is you can share these insights. So you say share, I can say, okay, I can send this link to someone and say, hey, check this out. Like you have a developer that makes a button, you're like, hey, this button sucks. Nobody clicks on it. Here, here's a recording. And then that's like the best way to communicate with them because then there's no real argument of people talking about, okay, this is how I feel about this button, right? Because it does happen that a designer says, no, I feel this is good. But this is a great way to really settle that argument that that button works, this design works, it doesn't work. So this is all I have for now. I hope it helps you to give you a lot of ideas about what's the process of going through having an idea in your head, refining it, designing something, even launching something without doing, knowing any design or coding in the first place, and then tracking, getting information based on all of the stuff you created, and refining it and doing it all over again. So I want to answer all of your questions. I'll be around, so please go ahead. Yes? You mentioned uh, the feed before, you see what other people are doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. What other pages they're on? Well, oh, no, 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 other websites? Yeah. No, no. Because all of this works based on the code that this website, this tracking website gives you, and then you add it to your own website. Is there, is there another? No, that would be very creepy and <laughs> that would break internet. <laughs> yes. They use, cookies for that? they use cookies, and cookies are on the way out because uh, on mobiles there are no cookies. So there's something called Pixel, and this mostly works on JavaScript. So every time someone goes, it loads a JavaScript, but with cookie, they tie it back to the person. They're like, okay, this is the same person that came last time, so I'm gonna add the analytics that I had from before to this one on top of this. But the tracking works with JavaScript. Yes? So that, so that just requires a snippet of code? Yeah, you just copy paste it. Again, none of this requires any coding on your part. You go to this website, you sign up, you're like, there. he's like, okay, copy paste this in your website. And the landing page you have is like, here, paste the tracking stuff here, and you paste it there, and it works. And it's free. Cool, right? You got a question? Yeah. There is one, I always forget its name. Landing, they have a weird name. Landing G or landing, I, Landing, please. Well, what, one thing you can do, every time you're trying to look for a tool to say, okay, if there's a tool that I can do this with, it's a great idea to go to Product Hunt and search for landing page. Whoops. And then we'll bring you all the different tools about landing page that you can use. These are landing pages you can use for inspiration, turn your app store listing into a landing page, all these different stuff. So there are tools you can go on pay, uh, different websites you can use. Yes? Um, back to his question, there's another site called Feedpages. Yeah, but that one you gotta pay, right? Yeah, that one you gotta pay, yeah. Sorry, one more? Lead pages. Yeah. That one? Like 
Yeah, yes. Have you ever uh, used a uh, what's that called? Expansion? Um, you obviously have browser options, but you never know what you can do with all of these different options. Envision. Let's check it out. Envision. Uh, yeah, we cool. There you go. Free. It's free too. And they give you a free T-shirt. You know why they're giving you a free T-shirt? They get your email and information, right? And it's obviously you're wearing their free T-shirt. So if you're in this market, all of your friends are probably in the same market. So when you wear it, you probably talk to them. That's pretty cool too. It looks great. So envisionapp.com. Thank you. Uh, you had a question too. Payment. So to keep things simple, the, if you want to accept payments, there are a ton of, like, literally a ton of places to go through. But my favorite one, and my favorite, I usually choose it based on the price that it takes from you, the charges, because if you're, start, if you're starting up, that's something that you have to look on. And how easily it integrates with other stuff. Because if you're a startup, you still you don't want to bother with technology and creating a custom integration with your payment processor. So based on these two criteria, the two that I really suggest are Stripe.com. It pretty much integrates with every platform that you want to go with. And it's very great API that you can kind of get a developer to work with. And all these big companies use it already. So it's not just some low-level company. I mean, Kickstarter does it. Kickstarter does probably more transactions than a lot of websites of all sizes, Twitter, Shopify, Pinterest, Lyft. So it's great for credit card processing. Another thing to keep in mind, a lot of people might not want to use a credit card or have a credit card. They want to use debit cards. For that, you can use PayPal. Yes? Not really, depends on what you're using. But any payment processor you use requires some level of uh, integration. If you have like a Shopify platform, doesn't require anything on your part, it's already done for you. If you have WordPress thing, it has a plugin that you just install and it works. You fill up some bunch of like fields. If you have a custom platform that you have built, you probably have a developer who can make sense of this stuff and integrating Stripe would be trivial. And um, yeah, and their charges are very decent compared to other people. Yes? Sorry. So there are a ton of ways that you can do it, but if you just want like a startup way to do it, I don't know how you want them to do it, but if you just want to receive the file and that's the only goal you want to achieve, you can use a Google Drive, Dropbox as an API that you can integrate with your thing when people upload it, use the Dropbox's API to get it. And let's say I don't have a good answer, you can go to Product Hunt, File transfer API, right? That's probably what I would search for. File transfer, and then there are a ton of these places, and one of them is probably going to answer your question. Another good place to find an answer is Quora, right? And you can pretty much do this. Site, semicolon, Quora.com. So that tells Google only search Quora, because you want to get legitimate answers. Uh, users, send me file through website, right? That's a pretty good description of what solutions allows users to upload large files uh, via web browser. That's exactly your question, right? And then you have this guy who has listed probably six answers and a bunch more. And you have a bunch of related questions. So you know, you can definitely find all these answers yourself. Thank you. What else? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, because it's a file at the end of the day, right? It's a video file. But if you want them to share, that's a different story. But if you just want to send you a file, it can be a video, it can be a PDF. It can be any format. Yeah? Is there a thing that does uh, video email? Video email. Yeah. Is that what is a video email? Yes. Uh, in the email, no, because that would really depend on what client email client they're using. And most email clients don't allow that type of stuff because it opens a whole another aspect. It's very heavy on the email. But 
most of the time it's just a link would do. You can add a screenshot with a play button. When they click on it, it goes to a website that can play the video. Yes. Oops, someone had a question? Any more questions? I have nowhere to go, so don't feel bad about keep asking, keeping asked questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming.